your wonderful festival. Uh, and especially the organizers, and most particularly uh, Elias, uh, who are thinking that I might have something uh, to say that might be worth listening to. And we shall uh, see. Uh, it is very clear, and, and everything that I have heard and learned uh, over the years makes it very clear to me that Eritrea's struggle for, uh, for self-determination and for true independence and for the material and spiritual well-being of its people uh, are a glorious saga. And I don't like to use those words, glorious saga, as it sounds like propaganda, uh, but it is. Your, your road has been a glorious one. Now, it's nobody's job. It is not the job of any particular nation uh, to be a model for other people or for other nations. But when a people and a nation demonstrably overcome huge obstacles over a 50-year uh, period, as Eritrea has done, you do become a model whether you want to or not. <laughs> and you have to face the consequences of being a model. And when you are going to insist on resisting the massive, coercive apparatus of the world's superpower, the United States, and that's who is behind Ethiopia, then you become a target. Everybody here knows that Eritrea is a target. Everybody here knows that it has a bullseye on its back. And I'm not talking about your history with Ethiopia, because you can handle Ethiopia. You have shown that you can handle Ethiopia. States, and that is a problem of a whole another order. <laughs> to the United States, you are also a model, but you are a very bad model. <laughs> One way that you can always tell that you're a target of the United States is when it's corporate media in your country strategically located. Eritrea is often referred to these days as being strategically located on the Red Sea. Now, of course, it is on the Red Sea, but that's not why Eritrea is called strategically located. That phrase, strategically located, is a code word for a place that's been targeted for strategic <coughs> intervention by the United States. It is a political category of word. Uh, it's not a geographic category. I, I remember uh, when I was a very young reporter, uh, how places that I had never heard of, and I thought I knew a little something, something, but places I had never heard of would all of a sudden uh, be called strategically uh, located. And I finally realized, and it didn't take very long, that the U.S., whenever I heard that term strategically located, the U.S. was planning to intervene in that country and in a very unpleasant way. And so ultimately, the little island of Grenada, which has only 100,000 people, and it's way out on the far eastern edge of the West Indies, it became strategically located. <laughs> Grenada didn't even produce much of anything except nutmeg. It, was, it called itself the nutmeg capital of the world. Uh, but it still became strategic in the eyes of the U.S. Uh, because the government of Grenada resisted domination by the U.S. Empire. Therefore, it is strategic. A company becomes strategic in the, in, in the eyes of the United States when it fails to fall in line with U.S. imperialism's global strategy. It, at that point, becomes a very important place on the planet. It does not require that your company have any oil or any gold or a location near uh, sea lanes and things like that. That designation is determined by your political posture in relation to U.S. global ambitions. So why is the United States setting the Horn of Africa on fire? Why is the United States militarizing all of Africa and with astounding speed. 
Why is the United States plunging the continent into perpetual crises? To answer uh, those questions, we must understand the nature of U.S. imperialism, uh, the capitalist world order, and why it acts the way it does. Uh, I want you to bear with me for just a few minutes while I talk about the nature of the capitalist crisis today. Uh, because the United States is bringing such great pain to the world because its system is in crisis. And it is uh, trying to resolve, and it never will, their own, its own contradictions and thus bringing about contradictions for everybody else and great pain. But uh, since the decade of the 1970s, finance capital in, in Britain it means uh, the city of London. Wall Street finance capital has achieved political hegemony uh, in, in the West, and especially in the United States. And that means that they control the institutions of power, and they control both uh, political parties. In fact, finance capital has more influence in the Democratic Party uh, than in the Republican Party. Uh, among the Democrats, finance uh, capital uh, is to that party as the energy companies are to uh, the Republicans. Uh, so, we have a hegemony of the people who manipulate uh, money. Uh, an example of how that was achieved, by 1981, the finance arm of General Motors, the huge car corporation, at least that's what you think of General Motors as being. By 1981, the finance arm of General Motors was making more profits than the division of General Motors that made the cars. And that's the way the world was going in the United States. That is how it has gone over the last 30 years, with what we call finance capital, Wall Street, uh, overcoming uh, what we used to call manufacturing uh, uh, capital, that is, General Motors and U.S. Steel and such. Now, this victory, this triumph of finance capital over manufacturing capital was a great turning point in history. I wouldn't be talking about such a boring subject if it wasn't really important. It, it's how history changed, and it changed the behavior in a profound way of the United States. And it occurred at the same time, as, as I said, beginning around the 1970s, uh, when the decolonization process uh, was reaching a kind of a crescendo. Having achieved that, that catbird seat in the United States uh, and in Western Europe. Finance capital made a decision. They decided that they would methodically disassemble the industrial infrastructure of the United States. They would monetize it, that is, turn all these factories uh, into money. And then they would export uh, that previous industrial capacity uh, to the East and to the South. We're not just talking about China, we're talking about the whole global south. Uh, we call that the developing world, and these, these terms are kind, of, uh, are kind of confusing, because the developing world, in, including China, is becoming the powerhouse in terms of the manufacturing uh, center of the world. Now this was a huge shift in the history of planet Earth. Understand, the actual making of things uh, of finished goods was switched from the industrial west and exported to the east and to the south. Uh, this is something that has not happened in centuries. Uh, to give you an idea of the magnitude and the importance of that shift, in 1950, which was uh, a year after I was born, the United States produced 60% of all the finished goods created on the planet, 60%. Today, the United States accounts for only a fraction of manufacturing, and manufacturing is only 13% of the U.S. Uh, economy. The U.S. gets its finished goods uh, from the Global South and from China. Uh, to further understand the historic shift from, uh, that, that separates uh, today, today's globalization and the historical globalization uh, that we mean by, by colonization, 500 years of globalization. When Britain first got its toehold in India, 
uh, the place that became known as India was responsible for the vast bulk of the textile production for expert in the world. In about two generations, Britain dominated the textile export to the world, and Indians were walking around with clothing made in Britain. That is a great example of, of, what, uh, of, of how uh, colonialism uh, transformed uh, the trade relationships and the productive relationships between people in the world. Now we see the West is exporting its industry in the other direction. In terms of their national interest, although capitalists don't care about national interest, but it seems like a very foolish thing uh, for those Western capitalists to do. Uh, very foolish to strip the home countries of their industrial capacity and to move to the low wage south and to the east. But that is what happened when finance capital triumphed starting around 1970. This is a class, we're talking about the Wall Street class in the city of London. This is a class of people that makes nothing, but it tries to monetize, turn into money, everything, to turn everything into some kind of medium of exchange. It functions only through the manipulation of markets, not through the production of goods. And the final crisis of capitalism begins with the triumph of these guys who don't produce anything, who only manipulate market, markets. And we see that that is unfolding right now in Europe, uh, where the finance capitalists have turned on their own home countries and they're eating their own states alive. Uh, not only did the Western finance capitalists export their industrial capacity, but that decision inevitably led to the developing world, to places like India and China and Brazil. It led to them amassing huge amounts of their own capital through the selling of all those finished goods, through the export <coughs> of their industrial product uh, that the West used to export. Uh, China has trillions and trillions of dollars uh, to invest. Brazil alone uh, controls more development funds than the World Bank does, and that's just one brick country, just that. Uh, even on their own financial capital turf, uh, that means that the United States and Western Europe have lost their special position in the world. They already lost their industrial supremacy, and they are about to lose. They are in the process of losing their financial supremacy, their ability to move the world the way they want it because they control so much money. They now have big competition from companies that used to, the countries that used to be under their thumb, who now, uh, in terms of Brazil, are more powerful than, than the World Bank. Uh, the extrication of our planet from the hegemony of the U.S. dollar and that is about, that's probably the last line of privilege uh, for, for the West. Uh, the last, the last uh, barrier uh, to making these Western countries, the United States and Europe, behave like other countries in the world, but especially the United States with its dollar being the reserve currency of the world. That is going to be the most complex uh, maneuver that the folks of the world uh, are going to have to pull off in order to take the United States uh, off of its pedestal. But believe me, people are trying to figure out uh, ways. So we see that in the very recent history, I'm talking about uh, since I have been an adult, and I'm not that damn ancient, <laughs> the West, which is under the umbrella of the United States, U.S. imperialism, has lost its industrial supremacy. China will soon be, if it is not already, and by some measurements, it already is, uh, the biggest world economy. But it certainly will be official in a couple of years. The developing world, which includes not just China, uh, but in terms of its powerhouses, India and Brazil, are independent engines of investment 
and development on their own, independent of whatever they say in Paris and London and, and Washington. The United States and its imperial allies in Europe are in eclipse by any objective measure. You and I have lived to see them in eclipse on the way, not out, but back to a normal status of, of nations uh, that will have to treat other people uh, as equals. That, has, that is, has either been achieved or will soon be achieved everywhere except in the arena of war. That is the only trump card that the U.S. imperialists and their allies have. It is in the weapons of war. It's, it's an awesome card, and it's the only one that they have left to play uh, in order to maintain their empire. The U.S. is responsible for fully half of all the monies that are spent in weapons, uh, on weapons, uh, in the world. And if you add in the NATO nations, they account for 70% of all the war spending in the world. The United States doesn't any longer have what they used to call soft power. And that was the power of uh, diplomacy, the power of example, uh, the power of, of being uh, supreme uh, in terms of having financial resources. We see it's been eclipsed in all those regards. Uh, but it still has supremacy of the gun. China now has soft power. It has the ability and, and the willingness to build ports and to build roads and to build railroads and to cut a relatively, relatively speaking, fair deal in Africa and ex elsewhere in the world. The other BRIC countries, India and Brazil, uh, and other emerging developing powers, they also have soft power, the power to uh, convince folk that uh, we're going to do a deal and it's going to be a fair deal. Let's enter into some business uh, to set up normal relationships uh, with other countries in, uh, in the world. The U.S. does not have soft power, but it has its military. And because it only has the military, it must of necessity rely on weapons of war uh, as central to every aspect of its foreign policy. It, weapons of war are central to the maintenance of U.S. imperialism. And that means that its strategy is quite simple, and it's utterly brutal. To maintain and even extend its ability to cheaply extract resources from around the world, it must rely on force of arms. It does a lot of talking, but behind that, there is always the gun. In order to maintain itself as an empire, and not just another country in the world, it must aggressively deploy those military resources, show and demonstrate its military superiority, and its ability to potentially deny access to the world's resources to rising economic powers of the world. Otherwise, the empire ceases to exist. So this, for them, is an existential battle. I'm talking about why they behave this way. It's an existential battle. They believe, and it's true, that if they don't behave in this way, if they don't wave their guns around, if they are not ruthless and willing uh, to break every international law in the book, they will no longer be an empire. And they're right. This is the empire's only effective response to its declining actual position in the world. So, of course, President Obama's policies are a continuation of George Bush's policies. Imperialism, and I'm talking about armed and aggressive imperialism, is the only card that the United States has left, and any Democratic or Republican president is going to play that card, but that's all they got. <laughs> it into a regional war. And of course, Obama imposes sanctions against Eritrea, threatening to declare it an enemy or terrorist-aligned state. 
That's because you insist on being outside of their empire and pursuing your own national course. Even, <laughs> even as you share a border with their biggest actual base in Africa, which is the duty. Obama sees the military domination of Africa as his own legacy, and he is earning that legacy. Eritrea is one of only three African states, by my count, that do not have a relationship with Africa. That's very important. The United States maintains military to military relations with almost everybody else on the continent but you, Sudan, and, and Zimbabwe. That makes you very special and it makes you into a target. <laughs> the pace of this administration's military penetration of Africa, that's the way we have to look at it, a, a penetration, and I'll explain why. The pace of this penetration has quickened dramatically uh, since the NATO overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi's government in Libya. NATO has stepped up very dramatically its efforts to create a standby expeditionary force, that is a kind of standing army or units that could immediately be designated uh, to form a larger force. Uh, they could be used for large-scale occupation of parts of Africa and of the Mid Middle East. Uh, they moved that plan uh, uh, very much further forward since their experience of aggression uh, in Libya. Uh, that is a very serious threat from NATO. Uh, however, that's not the biggest threat that Africa faces. Not these huge European American uh, land armies. It's not going to be that way uh, this time. The biggest danger, the real danger, which is already, in many ways, a practical fact, is that the United States will so dominate the armed forces of the member states of the African Union that Africa will occupy itself on behalf of the empire. That <laughs> Those elements are already in place. Aside from Eritrea, as I said, only Zimbabwe and Sudan uh, have, uh, 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 do not hold regular military maneuvers with AFRICOM, the U.S. African, African Command. Every single one of those countries, except those widely designated, engage in those regular maneuvers. Most African Union members use American communication systems uh, when they deploy and direct and move their tro troops around. They use American equipment and American systems to talk to their own soldiers. And that requires not just the American equipment, not just the American uh, playbook, but American trainers. That means constant interaction with American military personnel. And that's why they have these maneuvers, to introduce these systems, uh, to make these militaries dependent upon systems that the United States uh, are not just uh, uh, controls, uh, but created. AFRICOM is designed for the systematic integration of U.S. military forces and the militaries of every African country. The goal is to make African militaries entirely dependent on and indeed extensions of the U.S. military and its, its command, AFRICOM. Kwame Nkrumah envisioned an African continent that had its own integrated military that was capable of mounting a defense of Africans and African interests anywhere on the continent. But what Africa is getting today is a collection of national militaries that are integrated, in fact, in the defense of U.S. interests anywhere on the continent. That's where that dream has gone. The ultimate aim of AFRICOM 
Its whole philosophy, its mission, is to subvert the African Union itself to the service of U.S. foreign policy. In Somalia, that has already been achieved. As a Los Angeles Times article noted in just a couple of weeks ago, the African Union's operation in Somalia is a totally U.S.-run affair. The U.S. trains it, they equip it, and they pay for it. It is an American operation under the auspices, under the banner of the African Union. And we will see many more such American operations with the flag or the emblem or the logo of the African Union on it and full of African troops. But these will be American operations. Some activists, I'm talking about African-American activists, still uh, find some satisfaction uh, in saying that AFRICOM has failed to find a place to hang its hat, uh, a base in Africa. Well, besides the fact that it already does have a base in Africa, and that is Djibouti, the whole country, the real situation uh, is that AFRICOM doesn't need a base of its own. The purpose of AFRICOM, and I can't say this too strongly, the purpose of AFRICOM is not to build U.S. bases all over the continent, bases that it would have to make excuses for. The purpose of AFRICOM is to penetrate and subvert the militaries of the various African states. When that has been accomplished, all of the African military facilities will also become, as a matter of practical use, American bases, AFRICOM bases. That is precisely the plan for a 3,000-member U.S. brigade that President Obama is going to send on permanent duty uh, to Africa next year. That 3,000-member brigade will not have a permanent base. Instead, it will live on the bases of African militaries, various African uh, countries, uh, mixing up and, and integrated with uh, the African militaries who are in fact uh, based there. That is what they want. They don't want their own big base, which can become an object of, of nationalist objection, a uh, focus of independence-minded uh, folk. Instead, they'll be living in the barracks and, and on the reservations, or whatever you call them in the, there, uh, on the grounds of African countries' military bases. When Ethiopia in, invaded Somalia in 2006, a U.S. advisors accompanied uh, the Ethiopian troops down to the company level. And that was not just an expression of a unique kind of relationship between the United States and the Ethiopian regime. That, in fact, was the ideal of what Af AFRICOM wants to do in Africa. It's not a special relationship with Ethiopia. Uh, what they, their relationship with Ethiopia is the model they would like to see replicated all over Africa. Now, of course, there's a contradiction there because you can't be on both sides of the fighting down to the company level, but they'll work that out. At the core of the AFRICOM policy, and they're very, very clear about it, you can go to their uh, website and they'll tell you on just about the first page, the core of their philosophy is to create soldier-to-soldier -soldier relationship. That means that the U.S. strives to create a peer relationship between American soldiers and the soldiers of the various African militaries, based on rank. That means they have a general-to-general -general relationship, a colonel-to-colonel -colonel relationship, a major-to-major, -major, a captain-to-captain -captain relationship, and it goes down to the sergeant-to-sergeant -sergeant relationship, which is what you have to have if you're going to accompany uh, the militaries of the various uh, African armies down to the company level. The goal is to make the relationship between African militaries and the U.S. military closer than the relationship between African militaries and their own governments. That 
is the aim. That's how the United States envisions conquering Africa, not with 50,000 person uh, NATO expeditionary forces on permanent bases on African soil, but by creating an intimate relationship uh, between the U.S. military and the various militaries of African countries. If you go to the AFRICOM website, you'll see that they brag about something they call the AFRICOM Healthcare Partnership with individual African soldiers and particularly their families. AFRICOM claims uh, to be healthcare partners with 400,000 African soldiers who have received U.S. healthcare assistance. This, and this is just one of the many levels of penetration, uh, of interaction, of, of constant exposure uh, to their U.S. military uh, counterparts that Africa is really all about. Uh, we're talking about the deepest U.S. military penetration of African militaries that you can imagine. Uh, this, is, this is a very complex and sophisticated operation. Under those kinds of conditions, no large-scale U.S. occupation of Africa in the conventional sense, the way people usually think of occupations, uh, none of that is necessary. And that also means that no African government is safe because they have methodically created an alternative relationship, alternative uh, loyalties, and the government uh, of the various countries, uh, they, these governments are not necessarily implicated somewhere in their military command. Uh, but Africa, AFRICOM is the first, is the youngest of these commands. And so its application of this soldier to soldier relationship, this deep penetration of other people's militaries is more advanced uh, in AFRICOM than in the other military commands which have long histories and baggage. This global strategy on the part of the United States means that the Chinese, for example, can build all the ports and all the roads and all the railroads that they want in Africa, but the U.S. military is always going to be prepared to intervene in these same countries, no matter what kind of projects the Chinese or the Indians or the Brazilians have there. The United States will be able to intervene through its relationship with these African militaries to prevent any fundamental change in the relationship between that country and the world order as the U.S. wants to maintain it. So you can have projects, but you're not going to change the relationship with the United States and with Western capital. And, and that's very important. It shows almost a kind of perverse genius uh, about the AFRICOM design. Because Africa, most of Africa, much of Africa, wants Chinese development, for example, and wants uh, investment from Brazil uh, and from India. Uh, and, they, and these countries uh, have lots of money to invest, and they're eager to do so. And Africans want uh, a chance to strike a bargain if one is, if a bargain is fair with those countries. But the United States, through its penetration of these militaries, is putting itself in the position where it can pull the plug on any deviation from what folks used to call the Washington Consensus through that special relationship with the militaries. That is the plan, and that plan is moving along right on schedule. However, what we have out of mind, what we've been talking about, is a relatively orderly uh, imposition of U.S. dominance. Uh, it's uh, in the main a, a framework uh, for a non, not too violent, <laughs> uh, penetration uh, and takeover. But the world is never uh, so orderly, it's never so sanitary, especially in Africa, U.S. policy since independence, since that independence era, has been to create chaos in those places where it cannot exercise through some one means or other, where it cannot exercise direct control. Or, alternatively, it is to allow its allies to create chaos 
where it is mutually beneficial uh, to those allies and to the United States. And the most horrific example of that is the Eastern Congo, where six million people have died since 1996, primarily due to the destabilization and systemic looting of the Eastern Congo by Rwanda and by Uganda, America's mercenaries in sub-Saharan Africa. The genocidal chaos deliberately imposed uh, in, in Eastern Congo allows the United States and European mining interests to operate totally outside of the rule of law because there is no rule of law when you impose chaos and totally outside of the stewardship of the Congolese government which means they are able to stunt the development of Congo's uh, government, the development of a, of a workable society in the Congo. And at the same time, they reward the mining companies and they reward Rwanda and Uganda and their military class. Uh, in the Great Lakes region of Africa, we see examples of both U.S.-imposed chaos and the policy of cultivating the most intimate military to military ties uh, with African countries. The U.S. empire can live with both. It can live with loyal, strong men like Mobutu during one period of history, or chaos and six million dead Congolese in the immediately following period of history. It's all right either way. It all works for them. It can live with and it can arm and finance an African Union with a standing military if it gets to that point. If they are wholly integrated with AFRICOM, it cannot live with an African Union with a standing military that has even the vaguest uh, 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 resemblance to Kwame Nkrumah's uh, African uh, military that could defend African interests. So it's got to be a U.S. penetrated and controlled African Union uh, or chaos. What it cannot tolerate, and this is the bottom line, are independent countries like Eritrea. And what AFRICOM is designed to prevent is the normal development of mutually satisfactory and beneficial relationships between Africa and China or any other powers outside of the U.S. imperial orbit. The U.S. empire, and I'm repeating myself, but it needs to be repeated. The U.S. empire holds on by military means because the United States cannot otherwise compete in the world. It's the only card they have. This may be the last hurrah, the end game. Uh, only history will tell. And the United States and Western Europe thought that they were uh, hearing the bells toll for their end game uh, when what we now call the Arab Spring it erupted, those events in Tunisia and Egypt last year. Uh, it was absolutely clear to me that the so-called Arab Spring not only caught the U.S. government completely by surprise, but that it threw them into a total panic and confusion. You could tell that they were in a panic and in a confusion as soon as it became clear that the Mubarak regime was untenable. And when that happened, the New York Times and CNN and the rest of the corporate media were physically at a loss to give any kind of analysis. I mean, they were sitting there with their jaws open. They did not know what to say. These are not very smart people, and they have to have a script, and nobody gave them a script. <laughs> and, so, and so they were in confusion uh, because they are utterly dependent on the U.S. White House and on the State Department, and, and to some extent on Israel, uh, to provide them with whatever their worldview is supposed to be at the moment. The U.S. ruling circles, I like that, ruling circles. The U.S. ruling circles for a brief span of, of time had no response and therefore could give 
no direction to their corporate uh, media. Uh, the, these ruling circles were actually staring into an abyss, a vast chasm, uh, the breakup uh, that they've been trying uh, uh, to prevent all those years, and they literally did not know uh, what to say or how to say it. So that's why you saw about a week of confusion. So for that week, they gave no direction to their corporate media because they had no direction to give. Finally, they leaked to the New York Times and various uh, papers that the U.S. government's preferred position vis-a-vis uh, -vis this Arab Spring was that they liked royalty better than autocrats, which sounds really silly, but in fact, it was a signal uh, to the Saudis and to all the other royal thieves uh, in the Gulf that a new and renewed uh, collaboration uh, was about to begin and that there would be a response to this thing people were calling the Arab Spring. And then the United States and its European allies made the only response to the Arab Spring that they are capable of making. And I know you know what that is. It's not that I'm a Johnny one note, it's the fact that they only have one note. They would make a massive show of force to show who ultimately was the boss in that region of the world. They chose to attack Libya because it was politically saleable uh, to, the, to public opinion in their own countries, in, in France and, and in Britain and the United States. Uh, and also because the Saudis wanted Gaddafi's head, uh, and they had said so many times. But just as importantly, uh, Gaddafi's money had given the African Union in, the, in a few years the potential uh, to behave politically independent uh, from the West if they had chosen to do so. There was the material support there uh, to allow the uh, creation of independent institutions. And that, that ability, that potential had to be eliminated. So it was quite convenient uh, to attack uh, Gaddafi. But make no mistake about it, the NATO attack had nothing to do with any provocation from Libya, had nothing to do with any atrocity by Gaddafi. It was a show of force, and he was the convenient target. To accomplish the overthrow on the ground, uh, in addition to, of course, all those th tens of thousands of, uh, of bombing runs, NATO collaborated with the Saudis and Qatar and other forces to unleash the Salafists and the Jihadis as the foot soldiers, the reliable foot soldiers of what they call the Libyan Revolution. They did that knowing full well that it would guarantee there would be chaos in the region from now on. They understood that full well, but they did it anyway. And they have replicated that same jihadi strategy in Syria, knowing full well that it will create exponentially more chaos than what they created in Libya. They know that there is a huge blowback that will accompany this renewed empowering uh, of these uh, Salafis. They knew, they know this is, is going to happen. And they know it's going to happen soon. So that is a measure of the desperation, the extreme crisis of US imperialism, that they have taken the root in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. They have taken the root of perpetual crisis in that region and all the concomitant dangers that it imposes to them and to their own country. This is yet another indication that imperialism is running out of options and it is running out of time. This is a period, therefore, of great danger uh, to the world. Uh, we all need, at periods, at junctures in time like this, where history turns. Uh, we need to draw upon the great courage and the great perseverance and the great wisdom of the Eritrean people and others who put liberation above all else. Thank you.
This question is directed to my uh, longtime Karen Kindred spirit and email friend, Glenn Ford. Glenn, I'm Joseph. And this is the first time we've actually met Joseph in Berkeley. Uh, if I may have a brief comment and uh, a question. My comment is a political, an American political science professor once said that the old British political sitcom, Yes Minister, or Yes Prime Minister, was the best political science uh, course anyone could attend. And in one episode, in one of the British uh, neo colonies, there was a popular uprising against the authoritarian regime. And the Prime Minister says to his Chief of Staff, we need to send our troops on a goodwill uh, tour to that regime. And uh, his Chief of Staff said, yeah, how many? And the Prime Minister said, about 30 or 40,000. And the Chief of Staff said, isn't that a lot of troops? And the Prime Minister said, no, it's a lot of goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> My question uh, to you, Glenn, is um, First of all, can you comment on how the U.S., from my perception, if you agree with it, often tries to play both sides in uh, countries in the world in which it tries to, so, in which it uh, has its uh, interests? One with authoritarian regimes, well, where it will support the regime, like Mubarak's regime, but also just in case, because I don't think that uh, empires ever just roll over and play dead. They may be caught off guard, but they don't just roll over and play dead and give up. But just in case they have these NGOs, like the National Endowment for Democracy and other so-called pro-democracy NGOs, to support you know, some small group of, of, um, of opposition, and generally only give them just enough support to earn their goodwill, but in case that opposition rises and overthrows the imperialist supported authoritarian regime, then the, the imperialist like the U.S. still has an inway, a hook, into trying to pull off that opposition to do its bidding instead of the regime that has been overthrown. Well, well just, just, you just answered your own question, and you didn't leave me anything to answer. Uh, of course, the United States, just as it has military contingencies and the, uh, the materiel and, and uh, the manpower to match the, all these various military contingencies, it has political contingencies. Uh, and it fields operatives and uh, throws money around through a variety of, of not just NGOs, but there are uh, quasi-government agencies that spread money in every a country on the planet, even the smallest ones. Uh, uh, sometimes it's 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 almost like a surveillance kind of operation. That is, we have some money. Who would like to become involved politically? And so you get to identify. Uh, it has many uses, not, not just picking the next regime. You get to identify by waving this money around, especially in very poor countries. You identify uh, who the potential movers and shakers are, uh, who gets stirred up, uh, who wants to come forward because they think they want to make a change in the country. And so at the very least, uh, you have a Rolodex of, of, uh, of, of people who tend to be uh, uh, leaders uh, or want to be uh, leaders. And you can make use of that uh, in the future. So it's much larger. Uh, than just trying to stage, uh, have the ability to stage the next orange revolution or any one of these color revolutions. Uh, it's a kind of surveillance of the society as a whole, and it's uh, real cheap, at least in, in rich country terms. Yeah, Glenn, for the question I have to you is the State Department uh, was under the leadership of uh, Paul Condé Rice, now Hillary Clinton. But then there's a few uh, African Americans that have been an integral part of the State Department and where we, at least I, had very much hope that under their leadership, uh, the African continent as a continent, and specifically the Horn of Africa, would receive the attention that it deserved. But on the contrary, what we have seen is the worsening of conditions, situations in Africa. My question to you is, if President Obama gets re-elected, there is a big if there, 
do you foresee any change in the State Department with regards specifically to its policy on Africa in general? And of course, being Eritrean American, my concern would be with regards to Eritrea. That's my question to you. Oh, I expect that, that the Obama administration, uh, which, uh, as I said, uh, has uh, vastly escalated the militarization of Africa beyond uh, the, the benchmark that George Bush uh, built, um, that has been encouraged in a, in a sick kind of way uh, by its ability to overthrow uh, Gaddafi, uh, which, which uh, they tasted blood in that kind of sense. Uh, and which has now planted uh, special forces all over Central Africa. We, we know uh, in four countries, but uh, with the United States uh, Africa Command uh, and the relationship they have uh, with every, virtually every uh, military organization in the country, they could be anywhere. I mean, this is something that only the United States and certain African militaries can do. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, I, I expect a continuation if Obama uh, uh, wins election of the current policy, which he thinks has been very successful. I, could, I expect if the Republicans win, that they will build on uh, his ex escalation uh, of that policy. But, but when, when you were uh, phrasing your question, you reminded me of something, this, this, this age-old, well, decades-old uh, argument in African-American circles and it always revolved around uh, the, the paradigm uh, of should the United States do more uh, or less in Africa? Uh, is the United States doing enough? And historically, the Congressional Black Caucus was always saying, uh, the U.S. ought to do more in Africa. Well, uh, my position and the position of most people of my uh, political persuasion has always been, no, 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 we don't want the United States doing any more in Africa. So the U.S. is a destabilizing influence in Africa. It picks and chooses governments in Africa. It stops Africa uh, from having relationships with the rest of the world in terms of trade and many other relationships that are necessary for the development of Africa. Now the best thing that could happen uh, would be if the United States, and it never will, uh, not, not uh, voluntarily, but for the United States to withdraw from Africa there. The United States is not necessary. As we were discussing, there are plenty of other countries that want to do deals with Africa. Africa is in a situation that it has never been in in modern times, in which there are uh, business folk, uh, that, that is for private businesses and for state enterprises around the world who are lining up to make some kind of deal. And Africa now, uh, in, in theory, uh, has a lot of options to choose from and can make a bargain. What stops it uh, is U.S. imperialism. Uh, that is the purpose of U.S. penetration of Africa. That is the more uh, that the United States wants to do. And so the Congressional Black Caucus and these black misleadership organizations ought to stop calling for the U.S. to do more in Africa. Thank you.